Now, Mr. Rifen Podzik was so torn up, his body was so destroyed during that accident, that the individual in, in Colorado that was tasked with embalming him didn't think that the embalming took. He didn't think it was going to be effective. In fact, he believed that that body had to be cremated right away, or as soon as possible. Now, Mr. Pozic was a immigrant from Bosnia, and his family lived in Arizona. <clears throat> his family wanted to have his body shipped back to the country of Bosnia for burial. So they contacted a business out of the state of Florida that does those kinds of things. That business contacts Shante Harden and has him go to Colorado to pick up the body and move it to an airport. So after he gets that call, Shante Harden embarks upon his journey from Columbus, Ohio to Colorado Springs, Colorado, to pick up the body. Now when he gets there, Shante Harden knows the condition of the body. He knows that the body was pretty much tore up in that accident. He knows that the embalming probably didn't take that it wasn't going to be effective. And he knew that the recommendation was that the body be cremated as soon as it could be. And he knows that because the person who did the embalming told him that when he got there. Now, the testimony and evidence in this case is also going to disclose that the defendant had communications with the family of Mr. Podzik. He spoke to Mr. Podzik's wife. Now, Mrs. Podzik, is also a Bosnian national. She speaks broken English. She has difficulty with English. But she has a friend who also was on calls, who also spoke to the defendant, Mr. Ed Hem Mujic, Eddie Mujic. And it was made clear to the defendant that the body was to be moved from Colorado Springs to the Denver airport to be shipped out of Denver. That's what the family was told by the defendant would happen. That's what the family was told. Several days later, the body of Mr. Reif at Podzik shows up in a former hair and nail salon in Columbus, Ohio. The family had no idea. Now, when that officer from the Columbus Police Department went into that building, when, he, when the door first opened, as the court will note, that to the left of the blue blanket that covers Mr. Pozzik on that gurney, there's a wooden box. Now that wooden box, a rectangular wooden box, is covered by a piece of cardboard. Now when that cardboard is removed, what's inside that box appears to be a body that's covered in plastic. When that plastic is removed, What's disclosed is the body of Rhonda Renee Cooper, a woman who died on August 23rd of 2021. More than a month, more than a month before the Columbus police officer received that call, their body had been taken into that building and found Mr. Posick and Rhonda Renee Cooper. Now, As the court's aware, the defendant in this case, well, going back for just a second, when the police officer came out after doing that initial clearing pass in the building, he's approached by a third person. That third person tells him, I'm the owner of the business that's in that building. He identifies himself as Shante Harden. And Shante Harden is detained. And in this courtroom today, Shante Harden faces multiple charges. Now, as the court's aware, and as will be discussed in the testimony and evidence that comes before the court, the defendant presents himself as a man of the flock, a person that ministers to the needs of his flock. And that raises a question in this case. How? How or maybe why? Why? Does a person that ministers to the needs of his flock change 
change into a person that fleeces that very flock. Now the answer to that question is going to be disclosed in large part by the charges that he faces in this case. For instance, corrupt activity. Now with corrupt activity, Your Honor, the state's required to show that there was an enterprise of some kind involved in this case. And in this instance, the enterprise was involved, involved activities that took place in the funeral industry. Specifically, activities that were the purview of a funeral director. Now in those activities, there's directing or supervising funerals for profit. That's an activity required by a funeral director, to be done by a funeral director. There's arranging or selling funeral services. Filling out or executing funeral service contracts, agreements. Running an operation that prepares dead human bodies for burial by means other than a bombing. Operating and maintaining a place for the preparation, care, or disposition of dead human bodies and directly holding oneself out to be a funeral director or describing yourself in terms that directly implies your funeral director or a disposer of dead human bodies. Now, those activities specifically require a license as a funeral director. Those activities are not something that's just dreamed up. Those activities are identified in Revised Code Section 47701C, which specifically identifies that those are the requirements or activities that are done by a funeral director. Now, the evidence in this case is going to identify that this defendant was fully aware of those charge or those requirements at the time of the charges in this case. He knew that every one of those activities required a license in this state as a funeral director. He knew that because the evidence is going to be that the defendant received a letter in August of 2015 that was effectively a cease and desist order. A cease and desist order because he had been engaged in those kinds of activities and was told these are the activities that a funeral director license is required. They don't do them. Now, despite the fact that the defendant knew as far back, without question, as far back as August of 2015, that he was not to engage in those kinds of activities without a license, the defendant en engaged in a course of conduct that was designed to do what he wanted, to walk the line. Instead of calling himself a funeral director at times, the defendant would call himself an agent. He'd call himself a consultant. He'd call himself an advisor. Different names, but doing the exact same thing. The testimony and evidence in this case will show that in multiple situations, the defendant entered into funeral service agreements. The defendant arranged for or super, and or supervised funerals. The defendant arranged for cremations. The defendant rented a storage facility at one point, you'll hear about in this case, Your Honor, and he used that storage facility for storing bodies for periods of time. He washed the bodies in that storage locker, and he stitch and sew those bodies where it was necessary. All actions, which unmistakably are actions that are preparing the deceased body for final disposition. Now, at times, this defendant would brazenly represent himself as a funeral director. Flat out, no bones, I'm a funeral director. Other times, he tried to mask what he was doing, and the testimony will describe that, well, he didn't use the exact term, but he would describe himself in terms that indicated or implied that he was a funeral director, that he owned a funeral home. Owned a funeral home? He owned multiple funeral homes. He owned funeral homes in different parts of the state, and he would want to open up a funeral home in this part of the state, in this city. 
Trouble with that? The defendant didn't own any funeral home. Funeral homes in this state are required to be licensed, and they're licensed for a specific reason. And as the testimony is going to disclose, there has to be inspections of those funeral homes. If you have a licensed funeral home, even a licensed funeral home can't open up a branch office. The licensed funeral home, the testimony will describe, has to get a license for a branch office. And that's because those places have to be inspected. They have to be inspected to ensure that they meet certain guidelines. The most simple would be non-porous floors. The object, or the, the reason for non-porous floors, is fairly obvious when one thinks about why you would need that when you're dealing with a dead human body and leakage from that body and the possibilities of that getting into a floor that is porous. So the requirements are that you have to have a license for any kind of branch that would be for a funeral home. You can't just go out and use somebody's garage. You can't just go out and use a storage locker and you do things in it like this and claim it's a funeral home or it's a branch of a funeral home. Yet, the testimony and evidence in this case is going to make it clear that this defendant had no problem calling any location he wanted to call a funeral home a funeral home. The defendant, and, and by making that representation, it's clear he was implying that he was a funeral director, the owner and operator of multiple funeral homes. Now, he also identified the portal scene in an advertisement, at least one, where he identified that he had attended mortuary school, which is a requirement to become a funeral director. That's absolutely true. He did attend the Pittsburgh School of Mortuary Science. But I think one of the key requirements that's going to be missing is that he ever completed the school, that he ever graduated from that. And when you see that advertisement where he identifies, I attended the mortuary school, it's not going to say anything about completing it. It's not going to say anything about the fact that he wasn't exactly licensed for that school, implying that he had the qualifications necessary to do the job of a funeral director, exactly what the statute pro prohibits him doing. Now, the evidence in this case as related to a corrupt activity also has to establish that there were an enterprise in two, one or more fashions. One fashion is that there's a business entity involved in this. And this, as your honor will come to find out, the defendant used multiple names, multiple business type names. Celebration of Life Memorial Chapels. Celebration of Life Memorial Chapels Home Funeral Service LLC. Shante Devon Harden Support Services LLC. Shante Devon Harden Mortuary Support Services, LLC. Hussein Funeral Directors, LLC. All different names, but all names related to doing the exact same type of activity or the same enterprise. Activities that took place in the funeral service industry. Now, we'll also disclose an enterprise through an association of two or more people. Now, in this case, there's going to be testimony and evidence that indicates that people worked with and for the defendant in the pursuit of these activities. Now, in some instances, those individuals, you know, they pretty much knew what they were doing was not right. They pretty much, they, they knew that something wasn't right with what was going on, but they were hired to do it. They were working for it. They did what they were told to do. There were also those people who were just doing what their job was normally. Maybe transporting bodies, maybe whatever the, whatever the situation would be. But they were tasks that were necessary for this defendant to achieve his end goal in that enterprise. Both people under the statute would be considered innocents, necessary participants in the criminal enterprise, but not charged because they were just doing their job and did not really know that what they were doing was not proper because their job when they do it the way it's supposed to be is legal but they would be considered innocents so that would be another aspect to the enterprise 
Now, under the corrupt activity, corrupt activity can't exist unless there are crimes that are conducted, a crime more than once, or crimes that are classified in the statute as corrupt activities. And in this case, one of the crimes that's going to be handled in this case is tampering with records. Now, in this instance, the evidence related to tampering with records is going to be related to two things, both sort of to the same system. The EDRS, what is for the Electronic Death Registration System in the state of Ohio, a computerized system that generates death certificates. Now, with this system, it's necessary to get a user password, a username and a password, and go into the system and enter information into the computerized state system. And when all the information is finally there, the death certificate is generated. In the, state, in the evidence that the state's going to put before the court, there are a number, multiple death certificates. These death certificates from 2019 and 2020 specifically identify that subjects of the death certificates, the decedents, well, the type of disposition of their body, of their mortal remains, was cremation. Now, the problem with that is, and the reason that discloses the tampering, the falsification of information within that death certificate, or in the system, is that the individual who's identified as the funeral director with his name and his license number and the funeral home that's identified. All right, we need to uh, slip a break in here. Prosecutor delivering an opening statement to the judge, who's also the jury in this bench trial. We'll get you back into the courtroom after this. Stay with us. back opening statements underway in the phony funeral home trial. Shante Harden is accused of operating a funeral home while unlicensed and improperly storing human remains. The Akron, Ohio minister claims he was simply storing the remains for a former funeral director, but he is named Robert Tate. Right now, the assistant attorney general, Brad Tomorrow is delivering the opening statement for the state of Ohio. Let's go back right where we left off. The funeral director is a Muslim, a follower of the Islamic religion that strictly prohibits cremations. And the testimony of that individual will be that he wasn't involved in a cremation, he was never continenced in a cremation, and he wouldn't do anything. And he didn't fill out that document identifying he was a, the funeral director that handled that cremation. The other part of the information that's falsified in there is the name of the funeral home. Because in this instance, in every one of those instances, it identifies a Muslim facility that was identified as a funeral home. And that raises the exact same problem as with the funeral director who's identified as having taken care of those arrangements. You'll hear, Your Honor, that the religion of Islam strictly prohibits involvement with cremation. They don't do it, they don't countenance it, it isn't done. Yet, on these death certificates, cremation's identified, which is more than likely how the body was disposed of. The funeral home's a Muslim funeral home, and the individual is a funeral director that is a Muslim. That information is false, flat, flat out. Now, the question comes into who could have done that? Well, the evidence is going to indicate that the only people that had access to that EDRS system were other Muslims. Muslims are involved in cremation, can't be involved in it, and those are not the people that would enter that into the system. But there was one person, one person, that was not necessarily bound by the religious tenets of the Islamic religion. An individual who was a man, who's a man of the cloth, an individual who represents himself as a minister, a pastor. That's what he represents himself today. That's what he represented himself before. But the information that would put before, before the court will indicate 
that the people at the mosque, the people at these Islamic funeral homes that allow the defendant to have access to that EDRS system believed that he had converted to Islam. And that gave him access. They trusted him when he became an Islamic follower of the Islamic religion. And the importance of that cannot be stressed enough. Now, there's a second aspect to the EDRS that involves tampering with records in this, and that is access, registration for access to that EDRS system. Now, the court will hear that in the course of this case, in the course of events, there was a legitimate application or registration submitted to the, to the state for access to the system as a funeral home clerk. Now, the distinction with a funeral home clerk is they can enter all the other information into that system, but they can't enter the funeral director's name and they can't enter the, the number. That's his license number. That's the issue when the funeral director's password is entered in and the funeral director's uh, username is for username and password are entered in. It automatically populates those fields with his basically sign off on these on the death certificate. Now, in this instance, the applications that were legitimate were eventually revoked by those Muslim funeral homes. They, they revoked them because of the uh, events that were taking place. Events that involved death certificates that weren't legitimate, legitimate death certificates that weren't getting done. They didn't understand what was happening. But then there's this one. One for, I believe it's, I believe it's the IBNU mosque that became a funeral home. The funeral home is a Muslim funeral home, and the director of that funeral home will identify to the court. That was never authorized. They did not authorize anybody to submit that registration for access. The registration for access has signatures on it. It's got Shantae Devon Harden's signature on it. Not once, but twice. What's not on that document is a signature from the director of that mosque identifying that they want that access for the for the defendant. So those are the two aspects that are going to be discussed by the evidence in this case. <clears throat> now, the very nature of the tampering charge raises the next charge, telecommunications fraud. That system is a state system. It's a state computerized system. And the introduction of falsified information into that system is telecommunications fraud. Requesting access through a document that's forgery is telecommunications fraud. Now, there's also going to be a charge of passing bad checks and identity fraud. Now, talking about identity fraud first, because it's kind of linked into that EDRS system as well, that is not qualified in the state statutes as a corrupt activity. However, it's a crime, just a standard crime. And what that involves is, again, the sign-off, the electronic sign-off in those death certificates of a Muslim director on, on situations that involve cremation when he absolutely 100% denies that he did. And that the use of his name and his license number is identity fraud. And then there's passing bad checks. <clears throat> As the court might imagine, you can't bury somebody unless you have a cemetery. To get a plot in a cemetery, you have to pay for it, which the defendant did. He would use checks. You can't rent a storage locker unless you pay for it, which, again, the defendant did. He used checks. And what the evidence in this case is going to be that in the counts that involve passing bad checks, the evidence is going to be that those checks were returned in those situations. As we approach the top of the hour, we need to step aside, take a commercial break. We want to thank Alexis Rosenberg for her time and expertise. More of the opening statements when we return from Ohio. Stay with us.
welcome back to Court TV Live. I'm Ted Rollins, glad to have you along with us. On this Monday, we are watching opening statements in the fake funeral home trial. Shantae Harden is accused of operating an unlicensed funeral business. This is a bench trial after he decided, the defendant decided last week, that he didn't want a jury to decide his fate. He just wanted the judge to make the determination, and that is what is taking place. He faces multiple charges ranging from abuse of a corpse to intimidation. Let's go back into the courtroom. Opening statements from the prosecution right where we left off. In those situations, they were returned with unable to locate the account. Doesn't exist. They were returned with closed account. You have yet the checks written on it. They were returned with insufficient funds. And as we said here today, Your Honor, those checks remain unpaid, unresolved, bad checks. Now, there's also charges of theft and unauthorized use of a motor vehicle. Now, in those situations, Your Honor, again, in order to operate his business, in order to run his funeral director business, as well as a transportation business, he had to rent vehicles at times. He had to rent vans. He had to rent SUVs. In situations that will be discussed in this court during this trial, rental vehicles were not returned. They were extended. The companies that were the rental companies never got paid for to the tune of $11,000, over $11,000. And to this day, that sets out there as having never been resolved. Now, when those vehicles are extended or those vehicles are reported as stolen and then observed later on, that is the unauthorized use of the vehicles. At least one aspect of that. Now, there's a, there's a second aspect to the unauthorized use of a vehicle to theft, and that goes to the logical thing that happens when the actual rental company, such as Penn State or U-Haul, when they decide, well, gee, the guy's not paying his bills, I'm not going to rent any more vehicles to him. A logical decision. But now, the defendant's in a, in a bond. What's he going to do? Well, what the evidence identifies is that the defendant preyed upon the goodwill of somebody he knew. He got that person to actually rent vehicles for him. He would then turn around, do whatever he was going to do with the vehicle, collect his money, and then he would pay that person in cash. He would pay that person in cash until he didn't. And when he didn't, the person wanted the vehicle turned in. And when he didn't, the person wanted the vehicle turned in. And when he didn't, the person finally took it into their own hands, got hold of the vehicle, and turned it in. However, the bill had been run up. And as we stand here today, never been paid. Never been reimbursed to that, yet, that person. And here we sit. Now, that's related to this charge, intimidation. And for that, I'm going to go back to September 28th of 2021, when the officer was received a call to investigate the Livingston Avenue location. You see, at that point in time, the person who had rented the vehicles for the defendant, well, they had been into that location when the defendant's there. They pretty much knew what he did there whether they knew it was legal or illegal, probably not. There's no indication they did that it was legal or illegal. However, after the vehicle dispute, the call goes in to the police to come look at that location, and the person gets contacted, the person that had rented those that vehicles for the defendant gets contacted. And it says, quite simply, you better watch your back, you snitched. I believe that that person had been the person that called in to complain to the Columbus Police Department. Wrong, 
But nonetheless, that was the belief at the time. And that is nothing more than intimidation. The evidence is also going to involve criminal tools. Now, in this instance, the criminal tools are something that was necessary for the defendant to engage in his activities in the funeral service industry. Transporting bodies. Now, it's not illegal to transport bodies. You don't even need a license from the state of Ohio outside of a vendor's license for tax purposes. However, storage of materials such as the cremated remains of individuals that had their bodies were being disposed of in those vehicles for periods of time, driving around the state with those uh, remains, that is not permissible. Criminal tools. Now, these vehicles that we're talking about were found during a search warrant at a Muslim cemetery. In those vehicles, cremated remains of individuals were found in those, which had should have been returned to their loved ones long before the state of Ohio found them. Those vehicles had been bought by the Islamic cemetery, the director of the Islamic cemetery, and given to the defendant to use in his business. And he used them however he wanted, to transport bodies wherever he wanted. Criminal tools. Now, as might be indicated or might be understood, the defendant did not do this for charitable reasons. His services were not free. And the evidence in this case is going to show that the defendant charged thousands upon thousands of dollars for those services that he supposedly would provide people. Thousands of dollars. But yet, the documentation in this case is going to establish that this defendant from 2017 through 2019, never filed a single income tax form in the state of Ohio. He never filed an income tax form until the year of COVID, 2020. And he files one. He files with the feds and he files with the state. And in that one, the defendant who has never filed a single tax return before that, identifies that he made gross receipts of $102,000 in that year, in 2020. Yet, in 2019, no tax return. And 2018, no tax return. And even 2017, no tax return. Now, there's an additional charge called abuse of a corpse. Now, with abuse of a corpse, there's no listing anywhere that says all these activities are, that's abusing a corpse. If you kick it, if you drag it through the street, if you do whatever. Those things would all qualify as abuse of a corpse, but the requirement is dignity and respect, that the body of a deceased individual must be treated with dignity and respect. And in this case, Your Honor, the evidence is going to show you that in these instances that the state will talk about, that dignity and respect was lacking. That it was lacking to such a degree, it constitutes abuse of the courts. Evidence in this case will identify that the defendant would deliver bodies to churches or whatever, and in at least the situation the state will present to the court, it was nestled in the back of an old painter's van amid the paint cans. In fact, I believe the individuals that deliver the body, get out of the, the old paint van in painter's clothes, covered with paint, open up the back, and take the body out from the paint cans in a body bag. That is not dignity and respect. Bodies were delivered for disposal, for burial, in at least one situation that we'll present to the court. A body's dis uh, delivered for burial now it's taken up to the cemetery in a rusty old van again. But this body isn't nestled among the paint cans. This body's actually in a coffin. And when it gets there, the workers from the cemetery have to come out and help unload it because the defendants didn't have anybody with it. The state of the body was such, it was so decomposed that the stench 
of death was so bad that the worker at the cemetery got violently ill. That's only happening with a body that's decomposed, and the smell of decomposition is something that is unique, and you don't forget. And in this instance, it would only exist to that extent if that body was decomposed. It's also, there's going to be evidence in this case that bodies were embalmed. And I think for purposes of this discussion, the most simple is to point to the body of Rhonda Renee Cooper. There's no indication she wasn't embalmed. In fact, state will readily say she was embalmed. However, embalming is not mummification. Embalming does not mean a body can go forever without decomposing. The body will begin to break down. Yet this defendant stored bodies for whatever excessive period of time such that bodies such as Rhonda Renee Cooper was in the early stages of decomposition. As the court will see from the photographs of Ms. Cooper and here in testimony, there was green mold on her body, indication of decomposition. They're going to hear, you're going to hear that there was slippage, skin slippage, indication of decomposition. I believe there was an odor, not strong at that point, but there was an odor, indication of decomposition. There was fluids leaking from the body, as well as leaking from the body of Mr. Posit. And from the photograph of Mr. Podzik and the testimony, it'll be clear again, green mold. The bodies were decomposing. And despite the fact that one had been embalmed that supposedly were, the other one in a very questionable embalming, the defendant had those bodies in the former hair and nail salon. That, Your Honor, is not treating a body with dignity and respect. Ms. Cooper had been around, had passed away over a month before her body was located. In fact, I believe the testimony in this case is going to be that the defendant was misleading the family, telling them that her body had already been cremated. And there she was lying in a wooden box in the hair and nail salon in Columbus, Ohio. Not dignity and respect. There will be testimony that this defendant, because he doesn't have necessarily the facilities to do what he wants to do, he would drive bodies all over the place. He would take a body from Columbus back to Akron. The next day, drive it back down to Columbus. The next day, take it back to Akron. Not with the family's knowledge or permission, not with their understanding, but because he didn't have a place where he could put it. He would take body from Columbus to Akron to Michigan for cremation. Not treating a body with dignity and respect, driving it all over the state of Ohio and beyond. And as I indicated a little bit ago when we were talking about the purse and the minivan that was found, the evidence in this case is going to indicate that this defendant, after a person was cremated, he would return the cremated remains for weeks, if not months afterwards, despite the fact family members would call him up and say, where are my loved one's cremated remains? Oh, yeah, I'll get them to you. Oh, yeah, I'm going to get them to you. Oh, yeah, I'm going to get them to you. And it would cost, in, in situations you're on, it was months before they got back if indeed they got back. Because we believe that the evidence is going to indicate that in some instances, they didn't get back. Dignity and respect. Your Honor, in a nutshell, that's what the nature of this case is going to be. A rather large nutshell, but a nutshell nonetheless. Now the state believes that in part, the defense is going to try to show evidence that identifies that, well, you know, I might have done these things in the times you're talking about, but there were people that actually liked what I did. They thought I did a good job. 
Well, Your Honor, I don't think there's going to be any evidence submitted in this case that identifies there's an exception to the law that says if you engage in an illegal activity, but there are people that like what you did, that somehow that's okay. Hey, they liked it, even though even though I let this body decompose before I ever did it. We're a little past opening statement and the closing argument. There's not going to be any evidence that suggests that there's any kind of exception in the statute that provides for that kind of relief. The state believes that the arguments are going to be, as well as the evidence that's going to try to be put in, that identifies that. Your Honor, I object. He's talking about what he's going to say about our evidence, not about what his case is. I'm talking about what I expect the evidence to be in this case, Your Honor. And the evidence that should be preserved is going to be presented by the defense, the state believes, will try to identify that somehow he was providing a service that was needed. Now, again, the state believes there will be no evidence that identifies that even if a service is needed, if it's an illegal service or it's not licensed properly, that doesn't make it legal and it doesn't make it proper. And the state does not believe there's going to be any exception to point to at any point in time in the evidence that identifies that. Your Honor, the evidence in this case will demonstrate the various counts that are in the state's indictment. And that evidence will prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant is guilty of the charges that we've lodged in this case. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hoffman. Thank you, Mr. Hoffman. Thank you, Mr. Hoffman. Thank you, Mr. Hoffman. Thank you, Mr. Hoff